Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Alistair Ben and you're watching Expressive Photography. After what seems like months of storms, gales, rain, sleet, uh, thunder and lightning strikes, uh, we are back here on the west coast of Scotland on what has to be a typically beautiful and just such a calm and stunning morning. Barely a breath of wind, virtually no swell out there in the ocean and we're at this amazing beach that I've been to so many times before and the sunrise is really cracking off. Let's have a look at this first composition. It was the first thing we saw as we came down the beach. You might be able to see Anne Christine out there on the headland behind me, uh, her first appearance in a video for a while. Uh, but yeah, this little meander, it just seems so obvious to me as a feature. So let's have a look at what I've managed to do so far and we can discuss that and have a look at the image and then explore this beautiful beach more to see what it's going to deliver on this rather splendid morning. So what we're seeing on the back of the camera here is really a very obvious uh, arrangement that I can see really, which is this little uh, rightward slanting um, curve of the river running into the bay here and then looking across some open water to this mountain uh, and some rather pleasant light. Um, when I open it in Lightroom, however, what we tend to find is that we get what was I thinking syndrome, um, where all of a sudden it just doesn't feel like a photograph anymore. Um, now, maybe that's me being a bit harsh uh, with this photograph, but I think the big issue with sunrise photography in particular is that you get very wrapped up in the light, you get very wrapped up in the calmness, you get very wrapped up in the vibe that's kind of in that moment. It was beautiful. I mean, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, and making the photographs was a very pleasurable thing to do, but there's aspects of this photograph that I don't necessarily think work terribly well. The first thing that I find very obvious here are these two rectangles of blue sky uh, one up in the right hand corner and one up in the left hand corner. Now of course they're not perfectly rectangular but they feel, the blocks of cloud feel like slices, like slabs. It's almost like a game of Frogger, you know, where the clouds and the sky are trying to, you know, line up or whatever. I think that's a definite case of getting caught up in the light and it feels greater than perhaps compositionally it is. If I jump to the, the photograph I took before I actually recorded that introduction, uh, this was before the clouds had formed, I was before the sun was over the horizon, and this has a simpler feel to it, a calmer feel, uh, just generally it's a lot cleaner because we've taken out all of that busy cloud uh, activity, all of that very linear cloud has been taken out of the composition the light is obviously very nice in the second one. We've got this lovely warm light. It's a much cooler color palette with a bit of yellowy tones, a bit of warmer tones in the top and along the edge where the water uh, joins the beach there. My favorite of the two of these photographs or my preference, I guess, would be for the first one before I actually uh, started talking about the composition at all to camera. One of the things I'm becoming increasingly aware of these days is that every day is unique. Um, every day uh, I have a different opportunity to come into the landscape and see it for the first time in many ways. Now, many of the locations I've been going to over the last few days with this little private workshop, I've been to them many, many times. We're out in Harris and Lewis again. We're now over on the mainland. This particular beach I haven't been to for a while, but I've been here many, many times, and it is different every single time. The way the water pushes through the sand here, the height of the tide, how much surf there is, the type of light, the type of clouds. And when we're in the landscape, there are so many opportunities for us to fail. Uh, when we first got here, we looked at that nice little meander into the, into the, the bay there as the sun was rising we had some nice warm clouds there's not a lot of I mean there are clouds in the sky but the sun's still low enough it is going to come into cloud and it is going to get a little bit more 
uh, flat light or, or, or easier light, shall we say. Obviously, shooting directly into the sun, belting across the bay there is extremely challenging and rarely acceptably aesthetically pleasing. And what I've been doing is I've just been spending a bit of time on these ripples. There's a lovely little channel where there's a pool here behind me that's drained into this channel and it's produced the most incredible mosaic stroke patchwork of incredible detail and patterns. And you can lose yourself in this stuff should you choose to, should you be uh, brave enough, I suppose, to ignore the big landscape. There are so many things in the small landscape that are fascinating, patterns, textures, uh, the way the light interacts with this surface and creates a very three-dimensional abstract uh, patterns there. So I've taken quite a few photographs, some into the light, shooting across the light, um, you know, moving around this thing. If I was to go around the other side and shoot with the light, you would lose a lot of contrast because you've got the sun with you. It's all just a fascinating exploration of diversity of landscape. As I moved on and just started photographing the sand patterns, these I found to be very indulgent. Uh, I, I took a great deal of pleasure seeing those uh, patterns, uh, the way the light was just skimming over the surface. I knew that I was going to darken these images somewhat to make them feel moodier and somewhat higher contrast to create that shimmering light effect. So shots like this, um, again, I, th I think they take a certain amount of courage. Um, you know, when you've got a beautiful landscape around you, it, it can feel odd to kind of fixate on patterns in sand and the way the light is uh, over the surface like that. But these almost remind me of the sort of metamorphosis, the, 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 the Escher um, sketches or woodcut or wood carving sketches that he used to do, um, where you get that kind of evolution of shape through to, to different patterns and it all becomes a little bit mind boggling. Four by five again, of course, uh, just because it feels like it sits in the frame rather nicely. So the observant among you may have noticed from time to time one of these in the shot. It's a little bag which has a K and F concept on the side of it. And the folks over there uh, sent me a small vlogging tripod. Um, up until about three or four months ago, I was using another big Gitso as my vlogging tripod and it was just a nightmare carrying all my kit, plus a drone, plus all the other stuff I carry, plus my big tripod with the Arca Swiss head and another big tripod. And I was really in the market for a smaller tripod, something super lightweight that I could stick in my camera bag that isn't gonna make a huge amount of difference. And the guys at uh, KNF Concept reached out and offered me one. Uh, so they sent me this for free and they have been waiting patiently for a review for months and months, but I said, I'm only gonna do it once I've put this thing through its paces. So I have been out with this tripod on the Western Isles of Scotland uh, on three separate occasions this year, uh, enduring 100 mile an hour winds and pretty much everything that uh, weather can throw at it. Um, and I'm now prepared to say that I like it. <laughs> uh, so what I'll do is I'll open it up and show it to you um, and then we'll get back to the, the regular video. The thing weighs nothing. Uh, it, it weighs just a few grams um, and is a four section and the, the minimum one is tiny. It's a carbon fiber tripod uh, with plastic bushings so the actual legs have an integrated plastic bushing on them, which makes them pretty easy to take apart and clean. Uh, I treat this in the same way as I do all my other tripods. In fact, where it's been in the ocean or on sandy beaches, I take it all apart and wash everything out. And um, this thing has been great. I mean, I've, I've used it now in some of the worst conditions possible. And the saving grace, the thing that made everything work for me was this little hook here and even in the very worst of the weather I would take it 
I would hang my camera bag off it and it was absolutely rock solid. And I've had these legs so that they were uh, tensing with the weight of my camera bag, which is easily 20 kilos. Um, and on the top of it, I attach either my iPhone with one of the little brackets or a GoPro. Uh, I haven't used it with a bigger camera, but I dare say it would hold uh, a digital SLR or a mirrorless with a medium zoom. Uh, that wouldn't be a big problem. Simple locking mechanism and a simple rotation mechanism. So it's not a complicated piece of kit. It's not a... Uh, a super complicated tripod and it's not a very expensive tripod but what it does is it keeps my vlogging camera stable and steady um, and I'm prepared to say if you're in the market for this type of thing check them out um, I don't get any affiliate benefit out of recommending them you know I'm, I'm not accepting any money from them and um, they give me this uh, which I'm very grateful for um, but at the end of the day, KNF Concept make great vlogging tripods or lightweight trekking tripods. So why don't you check them out in the link at the bottom of this video. Now, back. In terms of talking about what we see and shooting what attracts me, uh, this solitary tree kind of uh, highlighted against this darker bit of hillside here really stands out to me and it's one of those ones where I want to keep it kind of, I need a faster shutter speed because I'm using a very long lens, this is actually nearly 600 millimeters, zoomed right into the hillside there and, and when I'm looking with my bare eye I can barely see where this tree is but with the 600 mil, it just highlights and we've got this really dark shape there in the middle. And I just feel it's like really framing that, uh, that tree that's kind of just isolated on its own in the middle of that really dark uh, area of woodland. Um, and yeah, I'm having to use a very fast shutter speed. So I've upped the ISO and decreased the aperture slightly. Uh, I could probably even go down a fraction further. And that way I'm getting one over uh, 250th of a second which means I'm just guaranteed to get a nice sharp uh, tree there. So that's this and you know if we start looking at some of the film around this area I'm surrounded by this incredibly huge beach uh, with incredible patterns and sand dunes but at this moment in time it was just that tree that caught my eye and that's what I'm going to point my camera at. I do like this scene. Uh, I think the tree that sits in isolation there is a really strong subject. I think the whiteness of the birch uh, tree trunks there stands out nicely against that black um, cocoon almost of that sort of protective cocoon. It almost feels like all the other trees are protecting that one tree. Um, and I like this one very much. I think the colour palette really uh, speaks to me of the colour of those birches, that sort of purpley uh, tone that we get right through the winter and into the spring before the first leaves arrive. That colour palette is nice, that kind of warmth of the light on there. There's a lot of detail, it is sharp where it counts um, and that, that was important to me. And I think this is a classic example of any lens can be a landscape photography lens. I have a 12mm prime, I have a 2470, I have uh, an 80 to 400 that I use when I can grab it back off Anne Christine and the 150 to 200. Uh, so this was taken, uh, uh, sorry, 150 to 600. 
This was taken at 600 mil and I've actually cropped it in slightly um, to, to tidy it up. I, I couldn't quite zoom in close enough to what I wanted. So this is probably about 650 mil uh, focal length, which is, you know, pretty long for, for landscapes, but there are things in the landscape that work at this focal length. So it's actually only nine o'clock in the morning here, but uh, with the sunrise being about 20 to seven now, uh, we've been out for a few hours already. Come around to this little second location here, not too far from the first one, maybe a 15, 20 minute drive. And it's an amazing beach, very low tide here at the moment. Lots of patterns, lots of sand dunes that's surrounded by birch woodland. We've got beautiful rocky mountains. It just seems to be a, a, a huge buffet of opportunity for want of a better word. Um, looking back on the shots we've made this morning, and as I said at the beginning of the video, we're really talking about every time we come into the landscape, it's a new opportunity to, to rebuild or to have a better relationship with the landscape. I was talking to uh, one of the participants on the workshop here this morning um, and talking about will, talking about um, the thing that makes us take photographs really. You come to these places but unless you see something that in your mind makes a photograph and that you're prepared to stand by and you're not using other people's standards to, to basically define your type of photography, there's photographs everywhere. Some of them might be very subtle, some of them might be very obscure, some of them may be very abstract, some of them might be difficult to understand. But with with a certain amount of craft and a certain amount of compositional awareness, we can make photographs that I think are totally unique and somehow represent very much who we are in this moment, in this place. And this is a running theme on the Expressive Photography channel here, is that it's not about just going out and eye candying the whole landscape all the time. It's about understanding what the landscape can give to us. I don't have any expectations. It could be a clear blue sky, it could be a totally grey sky. Sure, it's lovely to see the light, it's lovely to see contrast, it's lovely to see saturated colours when the sun does come out. And these are the triggers I talk about all the time, these five triggers of engagement, luminosity, contrast, colour, atmosphere, geometry the big five as I would like to call them these days, those five triggers in conjunction with our individual passion, our will to create, our need as humans to create, that is what makes photographs with low contrast, low saturation, somewhat subdued colour palettes. It's very difficult to make highly impactful photographs but we can make quiet, thoughtful photographs as the sun goes behind the cloud here now, I'm looking across the landscape and different things are catching my eye to perhaps a few moments ago when we had more contrast. Every moment is a photograph waiting to happen. I'm looking at this area over here and I'm going to point my camera at it right now because it's speaking to me more, more so than I'm speaking to you. The next frame also was using the long lens. And this is another great example of where that shallow depth of field, really long lenses compress the landscape so that uh, if you can, you can focus on something that's sharp and then the background blurs away in this rather nice manner. And I like this one, this is a 16 by nine in camera, of course, um, and the sun was just catching the dunes and the grasses on the dunes, the marum grass there. And again, we have some purple birch behind, but they're kind of uh, diffused into a very um, out-of-focus background, which creates quite a lot of depth. It's quite an atmospheric photograph, really, for something that's really quite straightforward. It feels as if it's really quite atmospheric. And I really rather like this. Again, I think it's uh, at the end of that little video there, I said I was going to point my camera at this because it was what was catching my eye. As we walked up the hill uh, back towards the car, uh, we looked down on another little beach and what we were looking at was this, and it's actually my favourite photograph of the day, uh, a massive expanse of beach and the tide was coming in and just taking away this pattern and this shape. 
uh, as we watched and I was very quick to get my camera out, get the tripod, get it on, get it mounted, zoom in and again 16 by 9 to emphasize the scale and going on from last week's video the aspect ratio makes this photograph for me. The 16 by 9 allows the content to point where I want it to in the frame to form the shapes and the space, the tension and the release, all of these things fit into this aspect ratio. If this was a four by five, or I tried to compress it into a four by five, we would lose a lot of space. It wouldn't feel so airy. Just to give you a sense of scale, there's a common gull uh, resting on the, the mud flats there or just in the water there. And you know, this is a really massive piece of beach. Uh, and I, I just really like this photograph. And, and it's funny because we started this day uh, at a very beautiful place in amazing light and the photographs don't massively mean that much to me. Uh, the experience was huge and I massively enjoyed the experience, but the photographs from that first beach, I'm a bit, yeah, you know, I'm not terribly excited and, and I probably wouldn't show them to anybody if it wasn't for showing them in this video. However, the last couple of photographs with the this tree isolated in amongst the other birch, that one really speaks to me. This is nice, this is very nice. So I think there's two here that I am particularly fond of. And this isn't a judgment necessarily, it's just a preference. I just prefer at this moment in time those two photographs from this particular day shoot. Um, and it's they're both things that I noticed just while I was looking around and experiencing the place. They were both images that were isolated out of huge landscapes, uh, both actually with the 150 to 600 Tamron lens. So I think the lesson that I want to really reinforce today is that the landscape may or may not deliver something that's good for you. You know, it, it may not deliver something that speaks to you photographically, or there may be situations where you see something that you get massively engaged with, and then when you get it back to the computer, all of a sudden it's like, hmm, yeah, why doesn't that work? Why doesn't it really um, fill me with that level of excitement that I had when I was shooting it? And that's normal. Not every beautiful scene makes a great photograph. And ironically, the opposite is true, that sometimes the most mundane, more ordinary things that we kind of snap spontaneously um, without very much thought, they sometimes make our best photographs. And I'd like you to think about that really as to why that may be. Why is it that the grandest, most majestic scenes that we experience sometimes don't make the best photographs, whereas the ones that we just notice and shoot on the fly suddenly become much more meaningful to us. So that's it for another week. Thank you very much for tuning in and sticking this far through to the end of the video. If you've got this far, you probably subscribe already, but if you don't, please hit the subscribe button um, and give us an old thumbs up. That's always really appreciated. And I look forward to joining you from somewhere completely different apart from my studio or the west of Scotland. Uh, we're gonna be away and I really look forward to bringing you some content from somewhere completely different. So stay tuned and I look forward to speaking to you again very, very soon, hopefully with a drink in my hand and some sunglasses on. Bye for now.